Uh, and Derek told me to, to share a paper that I shared earlier already in a conference. Uh, I thought of sharing a paper I presented in uh, Kuala Lumpur uh, two years ago. Uh, it's on um, KLD, the National Government Organizer an International Conference on Education. So I was one of the speakers invited uh, from the Philippines. So portions of this paper come from uh, that paper that I presented in that conference. So my apologies if some of the data, although not in 2013, but about 2010 and 11. But um, the references uh, I'll share with you where you can, where I got most of the information, uh, especially the data sets. So. Uh, let me begin first by uh, sharing a quotation from UNESCO. Um, uh, when they, did, they, they made a, pap uh, a paper on uh, the impact of, uh, or the attainment of the MDGs by, by 2015. We are familiar with the UN MDGs, right? So it's just around the corner, where um, uh, the eight millennium development goals are supposed to be achieved, and where are we right now? Where is your country, where is the Philippines, and where is the regions of the world? Uh, it seems that, uh, according to the uh, midterm report of UNDP, um, many uh, countries are making efforts, conscious e efforts to achieve it, but there are those that will be left behind and will not be able to accomplish uh, one of the uh, targets of the MDGs. Now, uh, for a line to that, UNESCO released this uh, paper and it speaks about particularly on financing education because um, they have noticed uh, shifting patterns with respect to how education is being funded uh, globally, and one of the things I picked up from there is, is this quotation saying that the enormous challenge ahead is then even distribution of human capital and funds that will allow some nations to take full advantage of new opportunities while other nations risk drifting further behind. We all know that, for example, that there are countries who really um, invest a lot in education and there are those who invest in other things. You have countries, for example, that invest more on defense and warfare rather than spending on education, unfortunately. Uh, our, gov our own government here has been criticized also for, for, for some time for uh, spending more money paying our external debt than putting money into uh, building classrooms and hiring more teachers, funding state colleges and universities. So that's my take-off point for our discussion today. Um, I only have two main points, and that's the uh, mega trends that I will be sharing with you. Um, a caveat is these are not my mega trends, but these are trends I got from, these are insights I got from the different resources and references. You may call it um, my perspective on the, this different um, um, trends that have been um, um, identified by different uh, think tank organizations. And then the second is research challenges and opportunities. Maybe this is the last part that uh, may have some use for you. I have some, some ideas that you might want to consider to uh, germinate in your minds and ferment in your minds. That could be topics of research or things that you might want to engage in in, in the future. So, what are mega trends? Uh, anyone familiar with this guy? When I was undergrad here, he was an acquired reading. You know, he was like a Bible here. Um, so this guy is John Naisbitt. He wrote a book uh, in the 1980s on uh, 10 new directions to in our lives. So in fact, my copy of this book I bought from the bookstore outside. For the re if you bought that time the original book, it was 600 pesos. I bought my copy for 25 pesos because it's a handy down copy. <laughs> Uh, but Naisbitt was one of the first few guys who thought of writing about the future in the context of how it's going to affect our scenario today. Of course, we know there have been many soothsayers in the past. You have guys like Nostradamus and many other people who claim to see the future. Uh, the difference with Naisbitt is that um, his um, predictions are, are based on, uh, on data, on empirical evidence. It's not just based on what he felt, what he thought of, and then he just wrote it down. So he mined data from uh, different data sets and also insights from different uh, resource persons, and then he wrote about mega trends. So he has written several books afterwards. He wrote one on ten, uh, mega trends about Asia, mega trends about uh, China, and uh, mega trends about the Asia Pacific. So he's one of those guys who. Um, promoted the concept and idea of megatrends. Now, what's the importance of megatrends to our lives, to our institutions, probably to us? Um, according to the Copenhagen Institute of Future Studies, they say that uh, these megatrends are, are important forces in social development because they're very likely to, to affect our future, uh, in our immediate future, not in a future beyond our lifetime. 
And today, many companies and organizations use these mega trends in their strategic planning and strategic development work. Uh, after going through or listening through the different uh, futurists talking about these different mega trends, many institutions take stock of these things and um, uh, consider this in their planning processes. Personally, in my experience as I work for a university, uh, we really take into consideration uh, many of these people who um, look at patterns of behavior, patterns of changes in demographics and many other things, and to consider it in our planning processes. Now, during his time, Naismith wrote these megatrends. In, in 1983, the megatrends he spoke about, and um, during that time, it was um, eye-popping, and people were surprised, and not many people agreed with him. Uh, of course, he was, uh, there were many skeptics, but if you look at the things he, he said here, how many of these things are very true right now? From industry to information, we are at the information age. Technology to high, to high touch to high touch. Everything is now touch based. It's, it's in the finger, they say. Knowledge is now in the finger, right? From nations to the global economy. You have APEC, you have EU, the Philipp um, very soon ASEAN, we have the ASEAN Economic Integration by 2015. Short-sighted becomes long-sighted. So the finding the true north of organizations, they really know, don't just plan for the immediate, but they really plan long-term. Centralized to decentralized. Our government in the Philippines, we have a decentralized system of local governance, and there are many decentralizations happening worldwide. From institutions to help yourself. It's like saying, if you don't know anything, what's the saying? You can Google it, right? <laughs> so there's the do-it-yourself thing. Participatory uh, or participating democracy, okay? From hierarchy to networks, so we have social media, for example. From, from north to south, so there's a shift in, uh, in changes in development. You see, like right now, Europe is in recession, America is in recession. And then many of the uh, stable economies, like Australia is very stable, um, and many of the countries in the southern hemisphere, like in Asia, the tiger economies are here. And then from either, either or to pluralism. And then he made a follow-up actually to the megatrends in 1990. So he said, what would be the megatrends by the year 2000 at the turn of the millennium? So how many of these are very true today? Are, are, there are signs that they're going to happen. The global economy is rising, okay? The return of culture. As we globalize, we become more conscious of our culture. We become even more protective of our culture. We become our cultures become more distinct. Uh, um, the the advent of market socialism, cost-oriented marketing, uh, free trade, fair trade, global community and lifestyles, um, the private welfare state. Okay, there are countries and economies that uh, rely heavily on this kind of system. Uh, where, in, where in people, uh, the sad thing here is that many people. Uh, decide not to work because they're taken care of by their governments. So if you lose a job, if you're out of your job, your your government can uh, uh, give you a, a subsidy, uh, food stamps, and all those things. Asia is rising, and that's no question about it. China is the largest, fastest economy in the world. As they say, God made the world, the rest is made in China. The time for the female leaders. Okay. So Angela Merkel and uh, many other leaders of, uh, you have the, the IMF, who's also uh, a woman, and of course, uh, you have the Prime Minister. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, uh, the age of, bi that's biotechnology, I'm sorry. So, well, um, GMOs, <laughs> religious re uh, re change. So, even as the world becomes more secular, as many people are saying, or many religious are saying, more and more people are also trying to find uh, their their uh, their faith, their spirituality. So you've seen a rise of more um, uh, different uh, sects and religious organizations. I found out from a, a colleague of mine who's a teacher who teaches a Catholic theo theology in my university. He teaches the religions of the world. That uh, for for Catholicism alone, there are already over 50 different kinds of Roman of Catholics in the world with different shades and strands of Catholicism. Uh, and then the return of the individual, the power of the individual, and then making sense of our self worth. Okay. Now, this is not my lecture. This is according to Nisbet. But this is an important context for us to see how these things are affecting and changing higher education. I'll skip some of the items so we can go straight to the, to, to the meat. 
So this is an example of how organizations are uh, considering megatrends in their planning. So HP, we know, is a technology company. So these are the things that they wrote in their concept map of what are the megatrends affecting their discipline, their industry. Okay. So they consider it from the different areas and aspects. Another example would be this one on the use of smart technologies. So you look at the different, well, uh, as an infographic, it just tells us what are the different megatrends that will affect the development, planning of smart technologies. Uh, another one um, on the role of megatrends in this kind of an organization. They're looking at the changing demographics. They're looking at the shifts in, in, in uh, the economies, the, the role of women, and then uh, the changing of uh, economies from an agri, industrial, to a service-oriented economy. And then, of course, here, the concerns as education is that increasing education attainment. More and more people are getting into schools, are finishing degrees and advanced degrees. My references for my, for my paper comes from the following friends of mine, from the UNESCO, from the American Council. Of course, TED, you know, TED is a good a resource where you can listen to the best speakers in the, in the different academic institutions around the world. University Business, my friend in my work because I get a lot of resources here. Uh, it's, a, it's a leading uh, international national um, news website in the United States. Of course, in our own backyard, CMEO, which is based in the Philippines. So they're in charge of promoting higher education in this region. And then um, the Chronicle of Higher Education, which is also based in the United States, which is the leading uh, trade publication for higher education. So these are the megatrends. These are the main in, in inputs that I'll be sharing with you uh, this afternoon. So in no particular order, but you'll go through them one by one. Uh, you have from enrollment growth. So I have some statistics to share with you, diversification of offerings, complexity and mobility of students down the line. So allow me to go through each megatrend. The first would be, oops, let me skip this one. Um, these megatrends are being driven by the following. Okay, so I'm sorry if you can't read it that well or just point out each item. Of course, we know globalization. So those are the drive these are the drivers of these megatrends, of course, technology, a more competitive environment, knowledge explosion, the changing demographics of students, the creation of new enterprises. Many professions today did not exist twenty years before. Uh, yesterday in my class, I was teaching public relations, I was telling my students that uh, there's a new job, this job uh, offering right now if you're into, because many of our, the kids now are into social media, right? Many companies now are, ha are hiring people particularly because of their social media savviness. You have social media strategists, you have a social media archivist, you have a social media historian. So many of the of many companies are hiring, are creating these new positions because as they increase their online presence, they also need ways to manage this. So there are, it creates new professions, particularly because of the service-oriented industries and the service-oriented economies that many countries are shifting to. The increasing demand for skilled and human capital. So <clears throat> uh, as more and more people earn advanced degrees and their aspirations go higher, there's an increasing demand also as many industries also expand. So the, the industries that are expanding right now, for example, globally, would be the, the leisure and entertainment industries. Hotels are, are going up very fast, left and right. Um, the gambling industry, casinos are also going up left and right. Of course, the outsourcing industry has been there, but it's predicted to reach a peak in the next five years. Although India is still the number one leader, the Philippines is the second largest uh, provider of skilled workers for this, what we call the sunshine industry. It's one of the industries that's keeping this country afloat, apart from our 10 million OFWs or, or, or overseas Filipino workers who work in many countries all over the world. So these are the drivers. These are the ones that are pushing and pulling the megatrends the mega in education. So let's go through each uh, megatrend uh, quickly. So tertiary edu education is growing in some places much faster than in other places. Example, of course, is Asia. China, Southeast Asia, South Asia, Africa, so, enrollment right now, um, uh, the latest data uh, that I was able to get in that presentation is that you have about 150 million students enrolled in universities. 
which is a 53% increase in just nine years. So there's an exponential increase here. Asia Pacific, in 1970, had only less than 4 million students in higher education. Uh, in 2007, that's close to 50 million. And Asia and China is the, is the leading uh, producer of college students. Uh, the increase is, the growth rate is 19%. But the main challenge here, and this is something I'd like to point out to you, that it could be an area for research or consideration, is ensuring quality and accessibility to institutions. Um, we know that um, there are many institutions offering a degree right now. You don't even have to leave your house. You can earn a PhD, I heard, from some universities abroad that are called diploma mills, just by using your finger <laughs> and your wallet, of course, because you have to pay them. And then accessibility, both physically and virtually, and the different ways in which people would gain access to educational institutions and offerings. I remember uh, one of my bosses in La Salle, uh, his name was Brother Andrew. He used to be the Secretary of Education here in the Philippines. 20 years ago, uh, brother, I, 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 I was a college student then. Brother Andrew delivered a paper uh, in a seminar I attended. And he said, the future school is like a gasoline station. He said, if you need gas, if you run out of gas, you go there. At that time, like, okay. But right now, it's coming to fruition. Many schools are offering now more short-term programs, short-term courses. And people come and go in schools. It's not, you will not... Uh, see now, uh, you still have the traditional three, the bachelor's and the master's and, and, and the doctorate programs, but you have more and more diversified offerings. So in people with, with short term, uh, with very short time to learn or have a short window to, to take to learn new things, to, to acquire it and to take it from the institutions of their choice. So there is an expanding growth in the enrollments in the following year in, 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 in this region, in these countries. So, if you look at the pattern, of course, when you say gross enrollment ratio, it means the percentage of people of college age that are, that are in college. Okay? So, it only shows, for example, here in North America and Western Europe, most of the Europeans of college age are able to go to school. But the, but the, but the uh, national or international average is around this range. And the Asia Pacific, we're approximately at, at that average. It's about 25 to 30 percent of people of college age that are in school. So we're very fortunate to be studying, actually. Because 70 percent of those who are of our age are not even able to go to higher education. Okay. I'll just skip this one. It's mind boggling the data. You can look at it closely when I give the reference. Diversification of offerings and players. So as I, as I was referring to earlier to what Brother Andrew said, that the schools of the future becoming like gasoline stations, you see the growth of technical and vocationally oriented higher education institutions. For example, here in the Philippines, as we transition into the K plus 12 system, many, many higher education institutions are really thinking of offering the voc tech, not because of the need, but because of the, the, the imminent uh, scenario that there will become a time in the immediate in, in by 2016 that there will be zero college students in uh, in higher education in the country. I thought we're the only country that would experience that. But well, on a lighter note, I I, I saw in the news yesterday in Liberia, in, in Africa, 25,000 students who took up the entrance test to the Liberian Liberian University failed. So no one was qualified. So they will have zero enrollment the following school year. And the government was investigating it. How come 25,000 people, kids who took up the college entrance test, failed? So not a single person passed. <laughs> um, there's an increasing growth of private higher education in your own respective countries. I know that the scenario is different. In some countries, you have more publicly funded schools. In others, there are more privately uh, fun, uh, privately operating educational institutions. So there's a mix, but the trend is the increasing number of private uh, um, educational institutions offering educational courses. And of course, you probably heard of the, 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 the term MOOC, or Massive Online Open, open Course uh, Systems. So these are the new kids on the block. These are enterprises that are offering courses from cooking, baking, to a PhD in astrophysics, all in the comforts of a website domain. And you just click on a course, 
pay the fee or many courses are offered for free and then if you want to get certified you take a test and then you pay okay so you have guys like Coursera you have EDU you have Scholar you have the infamous University of Phoenix which is the largest of these diploma mills the University of Phoenix boasts of half a million enrollees and they, have, they produce no less than a thousand PhDs in a month that's their claim I know some people actually earn their PhDs there uh, from that uh, university in the valley somewhere in the United States. Okay. So these MOOCs are now challenging the traditional brick and mortar institutions like UPLD and my university also, De La Salle, because also we're now fighting for market share. So there are two views here. The reactor to globalization and the actor of change. Okay, the demand for higher and adult education is increasing. Um, UNESCO came up with a study and found out that in times of recession, there is a spike in enrollment in graduate education. The reason people are out of job and they're thinking of acquiring new skills, they want to get ahead because they want to be hired again because they cannot compete with the younger graduates if, they, if their skills are of the dinosaur or Jurassic age. So in times of, uh, in bad times, the schools reap the benefits of getting an increase in enrollment. I'm not saying let's go to recession so that we get more students, but that's something that uh, they've realized. And this, is, uh, this was validated by, by peers of mine that I met in a conference recently in Rome. Uh, many Americans and many of the Europeans there uh, who I met we're saying that, yeah, there is really an increase uh, at these bad times. Our enrollments are going up at the graduate school level. At the, at the uh, bachelor's level, of course, it's going down or it's stable. But at, at the graduate level, you have more and more adult uh, students enrolling. Okay, ICTs are, of course, providing alternative modes of uh, learning. Uh, before coming here, I was in the room of mom, I don't know, and I saw that there were still course cards being given, and I said, Wow, it's still here. <laughs> My university decided to do away with it, so we submit our links online and everything's online for two things, for practical reasons and to be more carbon friendly and carbon neutral. And we have we off we use a platform wherein our lessons can be delivered online and I'm sure it's also happening here. Um, there are different um, service providers that offer this um, opportunity for institutions to open courses for free and then for students to enroll online. We use EDU 2.0 by Graham Glass, who's American. But there are other uh, similar programs that are out there that allows massive online offering of courses and for institutions to get into the information superhighway faster. It's like leapfrogging. And then you have new types of educational providers. You have companies partnering with educational institutions to offer degrees. You have sandwich programs, you have, um, what else are the terminologies there? You have transnational uh, programs, you have, you have schools from the U.S. partnering with universities in Singapore, you have universities in Malaysia partnering with Australian universities offering dual degrees. So here in the Philippines, it's also a phenomenon that's happening, there are attempts to open up, but there's, there are a lot of regulation, that's why the, that, the, that's what is uh, preventing it from happening. In the Philippines, uh, higher education is in the hands of the private sector. Um, the private sector, although they don't get any pork barrel, we don't get any pork barrel from our congressmen, we are the ones helping uh, provide uh, education in, in this country. Uh, but in other countries, of course, the scenario could be different. Complexity and mobility, you are an example of that. Uh, our international students. You choosing UPLB, thank you for coming here. <laughs> to, it's an example of how diversity, uh, how uh, internationalization is happening, the changing landscape, the, the mix. Even during my time, I remember um, there were many already international students. We had classmates from Nigeria, from Bhutan. I only followed Bhutan when I was in college because I had classmates from Bhutan. It was a place I said I, I will visit someday if I have the money because there they have uh, regulated tourism. They have to spend two thousand dollars a day to be able to, <laughs> to go to that country. Uh, the rising participation of female and adult learners, more heterogeneous and socioeconomic backgrounds, and as we said, more international students. Okay, so cross-border. 
next week, uh, oh, two weeks from now in my class, I will have five students from Malaysia sitting in because they're attending a uh, exchange program. So they're arriving at the middle of the semester and because the school calendar, I understand, in Malaysia is also different, but um, we're accommodating them because they want to learn our culture and also learn some things about how we, our media systems here. So all of this, is very, we're very international right now. The demand will continue to increase uh, from 1.8 million international students to the prediction is about 7 million in 2000 by 2025. 70% of the demand will come from Asia. So you're, you're, you're seeing more Chinese, Koreans, um, enrolling in U.S. University Indians, and then, of course, Southeast Asia will, has a potential to also compete, of course, because we have our cost of education here is, of course, cheaper than uh, our Western counterparts. Australia has had a long tradition of welcoming international students. In fact, some of the faculty here are graduates of Macquarie and uh, University of Canberra and other Austra big Australian universities. Exponential growth is predicted for the programs and institutions provide, institutional, um, uh, providers. Okay. Women will form the majority in student populations in most developed countries. So this is something that the UN really wanted to happen access of, of to education, gender equality, part of the UN MDGs, right? Uh, universal access to education. Uh, because there are countries that women are really at a disadvantage. There are, there are still some countries in the Middle East and in Africa that even don't allow women to go to school to this day. The mix of the student population will become more varied in greater numbers, okay? Old returning students, part-time, and other types of students. The number of women enrolled grew uh, uh, very fast. Look at that six-fold increase. Uh, sorry for that. Um, complexity and mobility. Okay. 42 percent of mobile students from East Asia and the Pacific studied within the region. So there's an increasing number, and our colleagues from Southeast Asia are an example of that. With studying in different countries in, in the same area. China sends the greatest number of students abroad, of course. They're all big in many ways. Uh, the, the other major countries of origin are the following, as I said earlier. Pardon for the data set there. I was pointing out to the Malaysians at that conference. Uh, you're in this level. Okay, governance. There are now changing uh, or evolving patterns of how institutions are managed. So there's growing uh, autonomy coupled with greater accountability. In the Philippines, we have generally three kinds of higher education institutions. The, the, for the private, there are two kinds. Uh, there, there's one kind of the, the privately funded. And then for the public, you have the state colleges and universities, and you have the local colleges and universities. When I was in CHED, uh, there was an, in, an explosion of local colleges and universities. Uh, it happened because our law, our local government code, allowed our politicians to create schools, um, colleges, and even gain immediate university status without even going through the Commission on Higher Education. That was a big problem at that time. And I'm not saying that they're of poor quality, but they, many of these new kids at that time, the local colleges, we're not following the minimum standards set by the Commission. So in terms of structure, you have institutions like UP. Um, is, it has uh, constituent campuses. It's a system, but constituent campuses. There are satellite campuses. Offshore campuses are happening also in other institutions. Uh, the AMA Computer University has uh, campuses also abroad, for example. Privatization and corporational changes in funding patterns. Okay, so. The SUCs, of course, generate a lot of their funds from government, but there's an increasing decline in state support. That's why the tuition fee now, I don't know how much is the tuition in UP, I'll be very unique. A thousand. A thousand pesos. Oh. The cheapest is the Polytechnic University. It's still 12 pesos per unit. And they tried to increase it by 4 pesos when we were in Chen, and the whole campus went berserk. The students rallied, protesting. So you do the exchange rate for my friends here, 12 pesos per unit versus uh, 1,000 pesos. 
Polytechnic. Polytechnic is in uh, Metro Santa Manila in Santa Mesa. It's uh, the first polytechnic. It's the first institution to offer uh, board exam uh, related courses uh, in that area. Apart from UP, of course. It's of course, the road tracks. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's in her neighborhood. Okay, uh, rapid expansion of higher education in different given environments. Rise of national agencies dedicated to quality assessment. So, um, in your own countries, I'm sure there are ways in which quality of education is maintained, sustained, regulated, and managed. It could be government-led, or it could be private. There's a private independent body. Here in the Philippines, we have several accrediting agencies. One, uh, three for the private schools, uh, one for the state colleges, and one for the local colleges. So it's like peer, peer-to-peer -peer evaluation to look at the quality offered by uh, fellow institutions. Diversification of higher education systems. So you have system schools, you have networks of schools, and, and um, coupled with um, massive online learning environments. Okay, changes in the curriculum. So the curriculums of today will, what you're learning now in this subject could be taught in 10 years time in high school probably. That I realized when I was in college, looking at what, I was looking at some of my college notes, these are now being taught to high school students. So it's interesting, but it's really going to be a fact of life. As, as we become more knowledge-based, what we're learning here is going down to the lower levels of learning. The proliferation of the multi-campus system. Okay, funding. Uh, this is where I do a lot of my work now. I'm a professional beggar. Okay, so <laughs> don't worry, I will not ask for your money. But this is my job to raise money for scholarships in my university because we have a target of 20% of our student population should be on one form of scholarship. Because we don't get a single centavo from the national government, we have to be creative in raising our funds. So, uh, uh, enter resource generation and mobilization. So schools now are finding ways to open up their, uh, their property, to, to lease it, to some are even selling their assets, some are engaging in business, and are trying to find ways of um, generating additional revenue streams. Because both for the public and private schools, the cost of education is really rising. And um, it's difficult to keep the best teachers, it's difficult to maintain facilities, it's difficult, difficult to provide quality student life if you don't have the resources. So my job is fundraising, but I call it friend raising, because that's how you make money or you get people to invest in the institution by making friends with them. So we're trying to diversify the, the the scholarship offerings of the institution and of course the different revenue streams. Today, Yolo Pascual is on campus, not as a student, but he's shooting a movie with Tony Gonzalo. These are two celebrities, pardon my international friends. Our campus is actually a favorite site for commercials, for teleseries, and for many other things. I invite you sometime to go to UP, to, uh, to Bella San University das Marinas. Uh, it's a beautiful campus. It's like a small UPLB. We're a theme, which we like to call ourselves a theme park campus. And that's one of the ways we're, we're generating additional income, by renting out our facilities. Every February 14, we are the venue for mass weddings. Last uh, February uh, 14, the mayor married 2013 couples <laughs> in our gymnasium. And they rented the facility. So, the sad truth is that there's declining public sector support. I hope that if, if the pork barrel is abolished, they funnel it more to education. So it creates a possible double bind. Public support draws private funding, accelerated by liberalization. So even uh, state colleges and universities are also seeking funding sources from private enterprise. UP Diliman has the Ayala Techno Hub. They rented a huge uh, piece of land there to private locators. So they have a mall there, they have a call center there, it's a rep generating income for, for, for UP. I don't know here with UPLP, there's a mall or an SM or something that you're going to lease. <laughs> um, higher education growth has placed great strains on state funding. And in all cases, governments no longer believe they can adequately fund mass higher education. And that's very true in different parts of the world. And this came from Philip Altback, the head of the Center for Higher Education in Boston. 
But so in our case, we have to, um, our basketball team needs to win because there's a correlation. If our basketball team wins, our donors come in. <laughs> Philanthropic support. If they lose, nah, okay. or who wants to help? Who wants to help a loser? No, but uh, there's a correlation, so the, we, we really need to maintain stature in some of our institutions to be able to attract our alumni to give, and of course provide them with opportunities. Where Nasal is thinking of opening up a retirement facility for our retiring alumni in some of the areas in the country because there's a club or there's a demand in the U.S. That's the pattern now. The Ivy League schools. They're situated near golf courses, near rivieras, near places of retirement because many of their old money alumni uh, wanting to go back to their alma mater or have affinity with their alma mater are retiring uh, near their institutions. Uh, social impact. The social base in higher education will continue to broaden along with the uncertainty about the, how this will affect inequ inequalities and in educational opportunities between social groups. So this comes from the UNESCO paper I was quoting earlier. Okay. We're winding down. Okay, the knowledge gap, still, uh, there is this increasing gap, both economically and on, um, uh, on the information side between the industrialized and developing countries. Okay, so the choice of courses, for example, in our, for developing economies, we offer programs that are more of catering to the labor market. Uh, we're not offering the higher type of skills, it's got programs in the sciences and engineering, although we do offer that many of our state universities, but it's not also attracting many enrollees. At the same time, it's also, there is a mismatch here, for example, in the Philippines. When people say there's a mismatch in, in education and in work, it speaks of two things. One is there's an oversupply in certain disciplines. We have so many. Okay. of teachers education, business, nursing. We have an undersupply of engineers, scientists, mathematicians, statisticians. So th there's work out there, but people are not qualified to take on that job. So maybe our friends in the ASEAN can be that. Because when we integrate, graduates of other ASEAN economies can easily now work in, uh, in their fellow uh, ASEAN member countries, similar to the uh, European Union. Okay, English is still the predominant mode of delivering instruction, but Chai, uh, Mandarin um, is an increasing global language, not because of the one billion Chinese, but also because they're the diaspora of the Chinese. They're also uh, spreading out themselves all over the world. Okay. Part of the data set there. Connection and cooperation. The need for more flexible mechanisms to contribute to the rapid transfer and sharing of knowledge via linkages, partnerships of institutions. And this is where schools like UPLB are very strong at having international partners, higher education institutions, governments, uh, business, civil society. Okay, so these are some of the things that are in place. The GAPT, uh, the, the General Agreement on Trade and Services. When I was a college student, it was the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade before it was passed by uh, many states. The UNESCO Convention on the Mutual Recognition of Degrees and Diplomas. The Philippines and several other Southeast Asian countries are signatories to this. It means that if you're a graduate of any of the signatory countries, your degree should be recognized by that counterpart country. Unfortunately, if, that counter, if the other country you're going into uh, does not recognize your degree or is not a signatory to this, uh, they cannot. For example, in my university, we've had many teachers migrating to Canada. Some of them are PhDs. When they go there and apply to the university, they're not offered a professorship. They're offered a position equivalent to a master's degree graduate here. Because the Canadian system does not recognize the, the, the degree and diploma to be a PhD level. So I've had some friends who are yeah, PhD graduates here, but they're, they cannot be called professors or doctors. Because they have to take on additional courses. Or they have to finish a degree there for them to, to earn that respect among their peers in, in the institutions in Canada. Academic portals, okay, so this is an example of MIT, uh, the Maritina Institute, I'm sorry, the Massachusetts <laughs> Institute, or the Misamis Institute, you have that in Mindanao. Uh, was one of the first institutions to offer many of their courses for free. They, uh, the institution agreed that the best minds should be shared to the world. So the best lecturers and information materials from their best professors are shared in their, in their portal. And anyone can download courseware, content, video, etc. 
Of course, some of them are 30, 45 minute lectures like mine, which are sometimes boring, but you get to listen to Nobel laureates speaking to a classroom, so sharing his, his latest discovery or his latest research interests. Uh, of course, in the Philippines, uh, in, in Southeast Asia, you have the ASEAN Universities Network, you have the APEC Higher Education Network, Asia and the Pacific, and as I said, uh, the last one very soon, the AEC by 2015. Europe already has a very nice educational exchange program. It's called the Erasmus system. So millions of Europeans have benefited from this system because their governments fund this program where it allows Europeans to study for one semester in another EU member country and it's paid for by their government. So that's one of the things the ASEAN leaders are looking into to, to, to replicate also to fast track the mobility and the exchange of students. Because right now it's just a very small percentage uh, of ASEAN uh, um, nationals studying in other uh, neighboring countries. And there are very few government funded intercultural uh, educational exchange programs. And some of them are not even funded by ASEAN. It's funded by Japan, it's funded by Australia, it's funded by the UK. But very soon with this integration, that's one of their vision to put money into this to allow the mobility and exchange uh, of, of more students. Down to the last few. Okay, the brain drain. Okay, there are trade-offs as private sector provides capacity and cross-border exchanges in peace. Okay. Who goes where for what and stays where for how long, including migration? Of course, in some con this, this is a phenomenon that the Philippines enjoyed before when we had a lot of our scholars study abroad and then go back here to share their knowledge. But now the Philippines is not the, uh, the uh, flavor of the month of the funding agencies. Now, it's now Laos, it's now Cambodia, it's now Vietnam. Our, our neighbors are now getting more uh, scholarships. So please go back to your country because the, the, the scenario here is that um, uh, in, according to the UNESCO paper, for, for one out of five Indians that study in the U.S., only one go back to India, four stay there uh, to work. So uh, it's, it's, it's lost to the Indian uh, society because, in effect, they, they, they apply their trade there, their expertise. But in fact, they're supposed to go back to their country. So that's, that's why in the Philippines, we have the Balik Scientists, Balik uh, Scholars Program to bring back because we also had experiences like that. Now, some of the scholars set up but did not go back anymore and decided to uh, stay there wherever they were deployed. The trade trip, the, the quietly pervasive introduction of trade concepts, language, and policy into the educational sector. So, you have terms here. When I was in college here, the term commercialization was very negative here. People viewed it very negatively because it was a business concept saying that hey, you're going to sell the state university to, to the sharks, to the lions, to the tigers, to the pigs, to the politicians, and to the private sector. But now, there's, an, there's a shift there, of course. The, the, there's this realization. There's, there's really need to commercialize, for example, research. Uh, research institutions like UPLB really need to uh, reap the benefits of the research efforts that they produce. So they also need to commercialize uh, many of the things that, many of the good things that are produced by the scientists of uh, our research universities. The trade choice, the welcome investment of resources into higher education as an export industry. So you have here the examples of uh, Australian schools investing in Singaporean schools. You have the examples of um, American institutions partnering with Middle Eastern countries offering dual degrees, sandwich degrees, um, degrees that uh, there are, there's an increasing pattern of institutions that are offering uh, a bachelor's degree, but you have an op option of graduating with a master's, you can go straight to a master's program. Here you have to finish and then you have to work before you're accepted to a master's program. But now the pattern is many institutions are now trying to capture the market and have more students stay longer in their school. So what they're offering as, as a carrot is if you stay with us uh, up to a certain period of time, continue with the program, you don't, you don't just finish with the bachelor's, you finish with the master's degree immediately. And of course there are straight to PhD programs for some of the gifted childs. <laughs> I remember the summa cum laude of my, uh, our, our batch at that time uh, in, in biology. Uh, he was offered a straight to PhD program by Columbia University. See, si Mark uh, okay. yeah. He was he was the student council president. He was the president of his fraternity, and he was summa cum laude here. <laughs> he, had, he had everything. 
<laughs> he had such an happy life. <laughs> okay, what types of programs attract mobile students? Okay. Um, okay, this is the last one. The intensification of the rankings wars. There's an increasing interest of many nations, many governments, many university presidents about this crazy rankings thing. I want to be number one, I want to be there. Even my own president, but don't quote, he said he wants my school to be, our school to be the Harvard of the Orient. That's what he said in one of his statements. <laughs> he wants us to break into this uh, global ranking, so our quality assurance division are going crazy trying to uh, respond to that challenge by the president. Because of uh, these rankings, there's an increasing awareness, of course, of how institutions stack up against their neighbors, their peers, their partners, their friends, their frenemies uh, in, in education. So, institutions, I'm sorry, um, very small, they invest a lot now on trying to approximate or to try to, uh, to be aligned, their trust to be aligned with these ranking wars to try to invest resources, for example, in hiring more top-caliber faculty. But how can you compete, for example, in the Times QS standards if one of their criteria is how many Nobel laureates do you have in your faculty? Who on earth in Southeast Asia will qualify there? Automatically, you get zero. Okay. How much money do you spend per student? How can you compete uh, with Australian universities who spend like 40,000 AUD versus in the Philippines, it's 3,000 US dollars? So there are the, 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 there's the economic side to that, wherein uh, the, the rankings are being criticized for because it's very heavy on the investment side, and also uh, it, it really needs to be more uh, rationalized or revisited. Okay. So the latest rankings are. Let's find our universe. I'm sorry, we're not there. <laughs> so from the Western Hemisphere. Okay. Uh, the top ten. Our neighbors, Cal Institute, Stanford, Oxford, Harvard, um, and the questions here are interesting. And, and I, I, I saw the instrument. Uh, they asked peers, for example, graduate students like you, if you were to enroll in another institution, not of your own right now, where will you enroll? So top of mind answer. Schools that have a global recall, schools with a global brand presence, are immediately on top of mind. Who would have heard of my school or of other schools in this country? Internationally abroad, unfortunately, many countries are only familiar with four universities in the Philippines. UP, Nasal, Ateneo, and USD. So if your school doesn't have those letters in its name there, uh, your second, third, or not in their, in their radar unfortunately. So in Asia, Hong Kong, U of S&T, NUS, University of Hong Kong, which also celebrated 100 years last year, SNU, Peking, uh, Korea, uh, then another Korean, then another Chinese, and then no Southeast Asian country uh, cracked the, uh, the top. No? In the Philippines, I know there's only a few Filipino, but these are how the universities stack up. We're actually going down. Most of our schools are going down. Uh, as in as UP, UP, 398-376-276-262-314-332. But to, to allay your fields, UP does not participate in the survey. I don't know how Times gets its data for UP, but the UP system, the UP administration refuses to answer and submit their data here, but still they rank the, uh, the school. Um, with or without their consent. <laughs> okay, this is the last slide. Uh, these are the research opportunities I would like to probably try to look into and um, write about, think about. And some of this have been the subject of the earlier parts of, of my presentation today. Access. How can higher education be more accessible to the last, the least, and the lost? If I, if I were to quote the Bible to the most economically disadvantaged, to the marginalized, to the differently abled, both physically and mentally, to, to the poor, financially, and other, and other means intellectually. 
equity. How can we be more equitable in accepting more students of, of, of gender differences? Or the, the, um, reducing the gender gap, especially in some economies. The Philippines is an exemption. We're, the women here are very fortunate to have equal rights. In some other neighboring countries in our region, uh, women are second choice to go to school because they need to go to work or to, to get married early, start a family, and those other complications. How do you make education more relevant with the times? How do you make education that um, your graduates really serve the needs uh, of, of the country? How do you make uh, our institutions uh, more conscious of its role in social development, in empowering communities? My president, one of, um, my former boss who was also chairman of CHED said one of, the, one of his frustrations was the La Salle University here in the Philippines is known as an institution uh, that caters to uh, more or less the middle and upper middle class. But St. Lasalle, the founder of, of, of the order, opened schools for the poor in France. So it's a, it's a big departure from his origins. But he said that the reason why we try to educate these kids from the well-off is so that they can help the poor. So that was the, the mission and goal. But he said that one of the things you should look at is, if you look outside the door, the, the walls of institution, what do you see? Do you see prosperity? Do you see the school making a strong impact and difference to your neighboring community? If not, then that is an aberration, he said. It is a... Uh, it, 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 it cannot not exist in such kind of dualism where everything here inside is all beautiful and all dandy and like uh, make, uh, unreal and outside you see abject poverty. So do something about it, he said. So that's one of the things I remember from him. Responsiveness. How can institutions, how can programs, how can governments respond to the changing needs of the market, to the changing needs of people, to the changing needs of the world's economies? Of course, improvement of quality. Because now it's uh, there's the McDonaldization, McDonaldization, the franchisization of, of education. You have companies opening schools left and right, and it, it's like getting just a business permit, and then they're allowed to open a school in every nook and cranny and corner, and then offer degrees to the whole wide world because of online um, systems. So how do you monitor? How do you ensure? How do you safeguard? How do you protect? How do you ensure quality? And then finally, of course, sustain. How do you make schools greener? How do you make institutions less in their carbon footprints? How can education contribute to lessening uh, global warming? In the United States, they pioneered uh, uh, the Campus Sustainability Report and the Campus Sustainability Awards. And they recognize institutions for pra best practices in ensuring that their schools are eco-friendly, they, uh, that they minimize their carbon footprint. They, uh, they are schools that promote, like for example, zero, zero waste graduation. A graduation with not a single trash is produced. You have institutions offering more um, banning vehicles in their campuses and encouraging uh, uh, people to bike and walk. Uh, this could be subjects of research and studies and all those other things. So um, that ends my presentation. I'm sorry if I went a little late. Uh, beyond the hour, but we can still talk, we can still engage, you can Facebook me, or you can email me, or we can open the floor for some questions probably, or some insights. Not necessarily questions from uh, friends in, in this room. So thank you very much.